Good afternoon and welcome to day two of our webinar series on professional development, resume building. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by the Center for Sustainable Materials Chemistry. My name is Blake Hallman and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Our guest speaker for today is Carolyn Kilbeffer from Oregon State University. This webinar is part of our first installment in this new series of webinars on professional development. Today's webinar is hosted by the by the CSMC and the Student Council for Innovation, which is a student and postdoc-led team within the center. We created this webinar series to aid graduate students and postdoctoral associates in developing their professional skill sets. To give you an idea of what today's format will be, we're going to first start off with a five-minute introduction uh, about um, our guest speaker for today and myself. Our guest speaker will then give a 20-minute presentation and we'll lead off from there with a live question and answer with the audience. Should take around 20 minutes. And then we'll allow our guest speaker to uh, provide us with a take home message and we'll conclude the webinar. So to introduce our speakers today, uh, we have, we're have we joined today with Carolyn Klepper. She's assistant director um, at the Career Center in Oregon State University and myself, my name is Blake Common. I'm a PhD candidate at CSMC. Or excuse me, I'm a PhD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I excuse me. I'm a fourth-year PhD candidate in the Department of Chemistry. I received my bachelor's degree from Blackburn College in 2010, and I completed a master's in chemistry, master's in organic chemistry, from Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville in 2012. I currently work for Sophia Hayes at Washington University where my research focuses on solid state NMR characterization of inorganic metal oxide clusters and their corresponding thin films, which are then used for materials device applications. Our guest speaker is Carolyn Kilefer. Carolyn is the assistant director in the university's career development center at Oregon State University. She has been helping students and alumni since 2011. She is a graduate of Hastings College and received her master's degree in counseling from Oregon State. Carolyn has over 20 years of experience in counseling and working in the community. She has re reviewed thousands of resumes as part of her re work in industry and academia. She has specialized training in, in the hiring process, focusing on interviewing techniques, the center, excuse me, focusing on interview techniques, on choosing an enhanced job fits, increased job satisfaction and motivation through the use of the STAR technique. Please welcome Carolyn and thank you for joining us today. Carolyn, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to focus on resume writing and I want to start by saying that there is no one way to write a resume, but there are some ways that are really more effective. Today I'm going to share from my experience uh, working with industry for over 20 years and I've worked in multiple settings in state, hospital, private, nonprofit sectors as well as higher education. So I want to share from that experience, from the experience of my colleagues and from other employers' perspectives as well. So let's get started. Well, it does not appear that I can move the slides. Thank you. So your resume is really your first introduction to the employer. So your resume must be, and you, if you can click the slide for me, very professional. It is going to be your chance to share your professional and educational experiences, and you want to keep it professional. It needs to be um, direct and concise, and then it also needs to be relevant. Uh, you must be able to show the connection to the position that you are applying for in a very quick way to capture the attention of the person reviewing your resume. It's interesting because your resume, even though you think it's about you, it really isn't about you. It's really about how you fit the job description that the employer is looking for and their requirements for the job. Next slide. Can we turn to the next slide? Thank you. So the next part I want to take a look at is how do I prepare? And some of that slide is missing. Okay. 
Hmm. Oh, sorry. About okay. That. So um, part of part of the um, slide is missing, so I'm going to just talk about it a little bit. The part that you can't see on there is really talking about researching and looking at other resumes or CVs. So one of the things that you want to do is find a style, a format that works for you. There are several different formats out there, but you want one that speaks to you and that can best highlight your experiences. So take a look at family, friends, other people's uh, resumes to get an idea of what you might like yours to look like. The second part that you can't see that's there is creating a general list. The general list is really to complete a like master resume so that you are be going to be able to tailor your resume that you'll send in from a resume that has everything that you've already done in it because you're going to want to pick and choose what's relevant for that particular position. And the next part um, that uh, doesn't appear to be showing up, it says to use but don't use a template. Again, you want to get an idea of formats available that can best help you show or highlight your skills, your ability, your job fit, but do it in a Word document because as you continue to build resumes for specific positions, you may want to move certain things around in your resume to better fit that position and to show your relevance to that position quicker. Next slide talks about our goals. And when we're looking at a resume, a resume really isn't about you, it's about the employer. And what I mean by this is it's about the employer having a problem. They have a problem with um, job openings and they want to fill that opening with the best qualified, qualified applicant. You need to show the employer that you are the solution to their problem in about six to ten seconds. Therefore, you need to be clear and consistent. You need to be able to show that you have a tailored fit to that position. And you need to be able to do that in about six seconds. So the latest heat mapping study show that recruiters and employers take about six seconds to re do a quick once over of your resume to see, do I really want to look at this any farther? That's not much time, so I want to help you develop a resume that will capture attention within that amount of time. If someone gives you 30 seconds, consider that a bonus, but let's work for the most difficult uh, reviewers first. And then the, lastly, your resume is like your golden ticket. It is to get you an interview to the job. Okay, now you can change the slides. All right. So this slide, what I really want to focus is on basic resume focuses. If you look at this picture, you can see that the beakers come in all different um, shapes and sizes and that the compounds within the beakers are also in all different colors and amounts. Um, what we want to do is focus on a resume that really best highlights you. There are different formats you can choose to, just like this picture. The chronological format or reversed chronological order because you're really going from most recent to past experience is one way to do this. A functional resume is grouped by categories and skills and this resume style is really good if you don't have much experience yet in this field or if you have a lot of experience but some of it's not relevant to the field that you want to go into so you can really show the direction that you want to move into uh, and highlight that versus maybe some of the past experience that may not be as relevant to that position. A combination resume really combines pieces of the chronological and the functional to best highlight your skills and then there's um, the CV or curriculum vitae and that's a much longer longer um, format than the typical resume is uh, that you'd use for more of uh, an industry kind of position. Next slide. So resume or CV and some of the titles, I apologize, all the titles for these slides are not showing up for some reason today. So um, it's supposed to say resume or CV. So what style you use really depends on what your goal is. Next slide. 
So a resume is typically one to two pages, and it is a brief summary of your skills and your experience, your education, what it is that makes you relevant to the position that's being advertised for. It's usually used in business and industry. Um, the CV is a much longer version. Here it says it is between 2 and 12 pages, but to be quite honestly, I've seen many CVs that are upwards of 50 pages long. And as you gain more and more experience in your field, you may have more and more things to add to that uh, with teaching and research uh, experiences. I've seen many um, people who have a lot of um, experience uh, publications that may even start their CV on publication 100 and have the others available up, upon request just to keep the amount of information down or more relevant in a CV. Um, CV often has sections about presentations and grants and papers in which you will have in a different way typically on a resume. So let's change to the next slide. And let's look at the components of a resume. So what makes up a resume? What's essential and what's not? So yes, we can leave it on that slide. Um, the essential things are what's necessary are contact information, education, experience. Everything else is optional. So we're going to want to pick and choose optional categories. We can create our own categories here that really highlight our skills and how that relates to the position. Again, we always want to be the solution to the problem the employer is having, which is that open position, and how can we show that we're the best candidate for that and being solution focused. So we'll pick from those optional categories to do that on our, on our resume. But let's start with some of the essentials. Next slide. So the contact information is your next slide. And one of the things that I'm noticing as we continue is that most of the heading informations of, of our slides are apparently in a color that's not being picked up here today. So I'm going to just talk about those as we continue. So contact information. If you haven't, um, one of the things that I see here that people typically leave out is really um, sometimes their physical address. And if you want to do that, you possibly can. You have to decide uh, whether you want your permanent address there. If you feel like that would, if you feel like your location would not make you a viable candidate for a position. Sometimes people will leave that out, but in general you want to have your name, address, phone number. Professional email is really, really important. The hot stuff .aol.com is not really appropriate, so make sure you're using uh, your name uh, at a Gmail or an EDU account that is really professional. Um, if you don't have a professional website or blog, you might want to consider this. Um, the little cartoon at the top kind of speaks to Facebook, which a lot of people use, and it says that 273 people know that I'm a dog. The rest can only see my limited profile. So as you are getting ready to look for a position, you really need to check uh, what's out there on the web. And if you can hit the slides a little bit, um, things in that box might show up. Nope. Okay, we'll flip back. So inside that box, it should say, um, have you Googled yourself lately? You really need to know what's out there about yourself. If there are some pictures or informations that would not pre help you present yourself in a professional light, you need to take those down or ask whoever's posted those to take them down. Um, you, you, employers really do check what's on the web about you, uh, so clean that up. You might consider your Facebook account and whether you want to set some privacy levels to that if you don't already have them. And then lastly, you might want to consider a LinkedIn account. Um, 
LinkedIn, if you are not uh, already, ha if you don't already have an account, it's a purely professional social media website with people from all over the world on it. You can connect with other professionals in your field. You can join professional groups on LinkedIn. You can um, join groups of your university. Uh, there's a lot of alumni groups and other groups from uh, colleges and universities. And you can search companies and look for jobs on LinkedIn. So lots of possible ways that you could use it. And it's a popular way to set up that uh, professional presence out there. So we'll go to the next slide. And that really focuses on objectives. And objectives can be really dangerous. I mentioned working uh, as an employer or uh, hiring people in many uh, aspects. And as an employer, I absolutely loved objectives because I could rule someone in and out in seconds. Um, however, as a career professional, I really encourage you to be really careful if you use them. Make sure they are very customized if you use them or just leave the section out. Objectives are often written from the candidate's position looking for the job instead of how they're the solution to the employer's problem. So that is something to consider. And there may just be better ways to highlight your skills and relevance and fit for the position on your resume. So you might consider a qualification section or a skill section that may um, be better use of your space on the resume. Next slide. is the education section. So the most common thing I see from students, alumni, and others uh, in their resume section is that they, or their education section, is that they leave out the city and state of the institution. The best practice indicates that you should include these in this section. At a graduate level, you will want to include your dissertation or your thesis. And especially as an undergrad level, it could be a great idea to include some of your minors or concentrations. But remember, everything else is optional. You can put your grade point average on your resume if you think it will help you really stand out for the crowd. If you don't feel like this is going to be helpful, you may want to consider leaving it out. Next slide. This is a slide that's going to just give you some example ways of how you can put this on your resume. The main thing is that you want it to be really neat and clear. You Employers use this for a quick check to check off that you have the degree or educational background that they are looking for that is relevant to the position that they're hiring for. Remember that you have that 6 to 10 second rule that we talked about earlier. So you want to relay your information in a way that makes it very easy for an employer to see it as at a glance. And we're going to consider that forward for all the other sections as well. So chunking information in an area like this is um, really uh, a good practice to do. Next slide. Education section. So let's take a look at that. What constitutes relevant experience? Next slide. So experience is really anything that directly relates to the position that you are applying for. It includes much, much more than just paid work experience. So experience sections can also be divided into sections to best highlight your skills and relevance to the position. For instance, I might have a background in teaching and research from, um, from completing my degree. And if I'm applying for a position that is mostly teaching, I would place my teaching experience first. And if I'm applying for a position that is mostly research, then I would move that research section up and put that first. I'm customizing it for the position so that the employer can see my relevancy to that position really quickly. It helps engage them and want them to look at your resume even more. Next slide. Um, the next slide here, oops, again, we're having some problem with the uh, slides deleting 
deleting sections. So there are a couple examples of how you can put your experience here, but only one is um, showing up. So really what we're looking at is being able to include um, include the information at a really quick glance when you're putting in the experience section. You're going to add some bullet points to this, which we'll show you later. So next slide. This is a really important point, uh, especially in the science. We often have a lot of technical skills and abilities that we want to put on our resume. So sometimes we forget to add our transferable skills or our soft skills, and employers are telling us that these are really, really important skills that they're looking for. NACE, the National Association for Colleges and Employers, does a survey of employers every single year, and they ask them, what are you looking for, what are you not seeing from graduates from people across the United States. In doing so, uh, they're finding several things are lacking. One of the top things that they tend to be looking for is that ability to communicate within and outside of the organization. So they're looking for people who can talk the technical jargon of their field when they're talking to other scientists. Uh, they also want someone who can communicate that information in a way that someone who is from a different background can understand it easily and understand how that would apply to them. They're looking for people who can write uh, well as well as communicate orally. They're looking for people who are able to edit uh, their manuscripts or other manuscripts to make better documents uh, and grants and things. Another thing that comes up a lot is that problem solving or critical thinking wanting to be able to see and understand how that has been a process for or utilized by the applicant. So um, teamwork, leadership, um, the ability to understand quantifiable data, and many of these other things here are all soft skills. If you speak a second language, that's also something that I would really encourage you to put on your uh, resume because that can be very important too. In general, all of these skills are skills that you would take with you wherever you go because they are just a part of you. So um, remember to make sure that you're communicating about those skills on your resume as well as your technical skills. Next slide. So in this Slide, one of the things I want to talk about is your bullet points for how you're going to show your skills and highlight your abilities. When it's something in the past, you are going to want to use past tense action verbs at the beginning of the bullet points. And this is really kind of a psychological thing because past behavior better predicts future behavior than anything else. And if I can put an ED to that for something that I've done in the past, I'm giving the employer more confidence that they are, I will be able to do the same thing for them uh, and getting their attention really quickly. I want these bullet points also to be concise and to be a couple of lines. I never want them to go to over three lines max uh, for that because things start to get lost and I don't want anything that I say to be lost because everything that I'm putting on a resume should show value added impact or outcome and uh, I want them to catch it all. Um, at the bottom in here it says the average time it takes to create a solid resume is, and you can click that, it's about 20 hours. A lot of people think that it might be one or two hours, but it actually takes some time to create a really solid resume. And most of the time on the resume is going to be sent, spent right here in this section. Okay, you, next slide. Hmm. I'm not sure what's happening with the slide. It's making a little... Um, Interesting. 
So this slide is supposed to have some qualities on it um, that people sometimes include on a skill section. Uh, and, some, and the bullets that are missing says, learns quickly, always supportive, always gets along with others, team player, and hard worker. And the question are, is this what you want on your resume? They sound good, but it actually is a description of my friend's dog, which you can see here. So uh, we really want to make stronger bullet points than this. Next slide. The accomplishments. So let's take a look at accomplishments. Accomplishment statements are really, really important. These are those bullet points where we're going to talk about our experiences, and they need to show two things. Um, they need to show the action that you took to achieve the results, or basically how you contributed or benefited. If you worked as part of a team, that is fabulous, but they are hiring you, not the team, so make sure you're sharing about your accomplishments to this. If you can click it again, Maybe the next part will show up. Okay, and then one more time. Um, the second thing that you want to include in the accomplishment sections is really um, focusing on the value added, impact, and outcome. And whenever you can make this quantifiable, you really want to do that because that stands out to employers, especially if they're looking at the bottom line and how you can contribute to their organization, that uh, is really important. So we're going to practice that. Next slide. So most of you may know what this is. And if you can uh, go to the next slide. So one way to describe the picture you just saw is that the Great Wall of China is many miles long and is a famous tourist site today. And if you can click it again, that's really interesting. But is there another way that we can say it that will give us more detail and give us a better understanding of what it is? So the Great Wall of China stretches 5,503 miles and was built to protect the northern um, borders. If you can click it again, please. It's approximately 1.2 million people visit the wall every year, making it the largest tourist attraction in the country. Now that's amazing. That's where I can see how you are different than other applicants in the pool. So I want to make my bullet points like that so I can see who you are clearly and how you stand out from the other applicants in my pile. Um, so in a sense, this is like having a camera and back before you had the automatic uh, lenses where you had to focus it yourself. You, you know, at first you look and it's a little bit blurry, but you kind of turn that lens and, and focus that, and then it's crystal clear. I can see exactly what's there uh, and who you are. That's what you want to do with this section. You can think about it in terms of a microscope, too, when you put a slide under the microscope and at first it's really fuzzy and you can't really see what it is, and then you um, you focus it and it's crystal clear. You know what you have. You want your resume to be as clear as you can. Next slide. Okay. So it looks like um, the slides, anything that's written in another color is being deleted on that. So the really important words are kind of deleted from this one. It's talking about increased pros, um, profits, reduced errors, improved teamwork, created a new solution, designed an experiment. We want those power past tense action verbs starting um, all of those pieces. So let's move on to the next slide. And let's make some uh, sample statements. Next slide, and we'll read a few examples of this. So um, here may be some examples. Again, the, for some reason, the other colors of fonts aren't being picked up in the slides, so I'll read a couple so you know what they say. 
uh, improve lab safety training program through updating the manual and implementing mandatory, mandatory quarterly training sessions for faculty and student employees that resulted in 25% less accidents per year. Who wouldn't like a program that resulted in less accidents per year? The next one talks about instituted an organic chemistry tutoring program that increased average um, GPA from 2.9 to 3.3. Again, you're really showing your value of that. Um, increased student participation into the SMILE program by 50% through creative advertising. Those details really help you stand out. So when you're creating and crafting your resume, think of what details, uh, what quantifiable data you can put in. The problem is often when we're doing things, we don't often think about quantifiable data and what do I need to put into this. But we really need to um, start to think about that in the future because these are the things that help you look amazing to um, employers. Next slide. So this gives you just some example bullet points, and they're taken from different fields, so they don't all uh, line up. But it's just some ideas of some things that you might want to be put down. The last one talks about analyzed records for filled soil samples with a 99.8% accuracy rate. That tells me that you're pretty accurate. You pay attention to details. What scientist does not need to do that in their work? So that gives me more confidence in you. The next bullet point up talks about having four years of experience. I'm getting a better picture of how much experience you might have with that from the time period that you've used. Um, so I want to be as specific as I can when it will help me stand out. Next slide. So why do this? And really the reason to do this is because it can help me understand and better highlight my skills and ability for you on the resume. I can feel more confident about that and develop uh, my responses later on for when I'm uh, doing an interview with the employer as well. So it helps me understand that and bring value uh, to the employer as well. Next slide. So um, in this webinar format, we aren't going to actually practice um, telling your resume to this job, but I really wanted to give it to you to give you an idea of what an actual job description looks like out there in the field today. Um, so we can start identifying and customizing ways um, that you could customize your resume. So um, this is an actual job description on this indeed. And I am no way supporting or promoting this particular company or companies. I'm only using it as a real life example of a job description that is on the web today. So if we look at this job description, we can easily see the relevant degree that they need, the background, the technical skills, and the soft skills that they're looking for. So we may think of things to include our specific technical skills, but this also talks about the collaboration and the ability to uh, really need to communicate well with others and uh, different groups. Those are things we need to remember um, to put on the resume as well, and perhaps our cover letter. Okay, um, there's another example. This one was for a PhD level. There's another example, uh, one on the next slide, that is for a four-year um, degree or bachelor's level degree. Again, if we take a look at this particular um, position that's on Indeed right now, we can start to look at what are they looking for what do I need to include or prioritize in my resume? I may even have a particular job that I have and I have different bullet points under it. I may move different things up and around within that section to grab the attention of the person reviewing my resume to make it fit and capture what they're looking for. So for instance, on this particular one, 
One of the bullet points talks about strong critical thinking skills. If I have a bullet point that talks about that, I may want to move that up uh, in my description so that the employer sees that at a glance, sees my relevancy. I'm going to stand out a lot more that way. Next slide. So these are some examples of what not to do. Uh, in the U.S., you do not want to include a picture on your resume. Uh, salary requirements are left out and less specifically asked for an employer. Personal information is not on resumes uh, in the United States, uh, so I definitely leave that information out. In fact, if you put some of that information on, you may automatically kind of disqualify you for them looking at it any further. Um, so make sure that um, you follow the standards of um, the country that you are applying for. It's really important to note that if you're applying for some jobs outside of the U.S., some countries actually require some of this information I told you to leave out. Uh, so you really need to make sure you've researched what the standard is for that particular country to make your resume uh, fit for that audience. Okay, next slide. So references. Do I need them? Absolutely, yes. Make sure you ask your references if you can use them as a reference. You don't want them to be called uh, later and not know that they are going to be called. I was on a search committee not very long ago and I called one of the references on the, uh, they had and they had not spoke to that person for 15 years so don't leave them in that position. That's a pretty uncomfortable position for them. So provide your references a copy of your resume too so they have up-to-date information on what you've done at their fingertips. And this is really especially helpful when one of your references may not be from your current position that they've known what you have done since then. Um, it just makes it easier for them to better support you in the hiring process. Um, so make sure you help them. And you always want your references to be on a separate page on a resume. Uh, sometimes on a CV, they will be included within the CV. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so this is an example of what you might want to have on your uh, references. You want to have your contact information at the top of the page. So again, if pages get separated, they know who they go to. And then you're going to want to include all of your information about your references. I often see uh, students giving sometimes a name and then maybe an email. But they really want to know who they are, how they are related to you. Uh, so when they call them too, they'll have an idea of where that connection is. You typically want to include at least three references. Three to five is pretty standard, with three being the most standard, and you want to list them in the order of relevance. Um, typically, the most recent uh, ones or the most important ones first. Uh, next slide. So some points to remember. Next slide. So make sure you tailor your resume to that particular job within that industry. It needs to speak to the employer. Omit any personal pronouns. Speak in phrases and not long paragraphs. Information gets lost in long paragraphs. Your margin should be about a half an inch to an inch, and a typical resume is a one to two pages in length. That's pretty standard. If you are submitting electronically and a lot of um, places are asking for electronically uh, submitted resumes, remember to convert to a PDF first. Uh, if you don't, sometimes what they get on the other end is a little garbly go, and that's going to make it really hard for the reviewer to look at it and may, in fact, um, be a factor in whether you're selected uh, to move forward in the process or not. 
So definitely convert to something that is not going to, that's going to keep your format in the format you really want them to see. Use power past action verbs. Give them the confidence that you have done this in the past and that you can do this in the future. Okay, next slide. Questions? Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'm sorry for the technical, technical difficulties we had in the slide deck. Um, we will now move on to the, our live Q&A with the audience. Um, audience members, I am actually having some technical difficulties uh, with my control panel. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat dialog box and send them to me. My name is Blake uh, Hammon. Um, and uh, also another note, um, in your control panel, you'll see a handout section. Um, Carolyn has made available several handouts for today's webinar. Um, feel free to download those at, download those at your convenience. Uh, we will also have them posted on the website um, a little later today. Um, so, if, so Carolyn, we'll start with uh, some questions. Um, my first question for you is, um, with the electronic age, um, you have the option of doing electronic versus um, um, the, the old, old hard copy um, resumes. Um, is there anything you would do differently between the two? So the main thing that needs to be different is certainly making sure when you submit your electronic resume that it is in a PDF format or a format that won't look differently to um, the person who's receiving it. I've had resumes sent to me that I'm sure look beautiful on the applicant side, but when I've seen them, they are all over the place and very, very hard to follow. Um, the other thing I guess I would pay attention to is if they're asking for anything specifically. Usually they aren't. Um, but sometimes they may ask for something specifically. So in that case, when you're submitting electronically, make sure you're following the directions. Usually that goes beyond attaching your resume, but sometimes there will be additional questions to ask or another format that they want something in. And uh, if that's the case, um, companies and organizations are really looking at do people follow directions in that app? Uh, electronic format, and if you don't follow those directions, sometimes that is one way the companies and organizations will um, sort out uh, or sort in and out who they're going to move forward just based on those little details. So when submitting electronically, make sure that you're following their format. The other piece I recommend too is maybe just if there's a contact person there, just um, going ahead and sending a quick email saying, hey, I um, completed uh, the application process, just wanted to make sure you got everything okay in case something didn't upload correctly and they didn't get that piece. That way um, you're pretty sure to have a complete application and not be ruled out because something you thought had uploaded correctly did not. To your last point there, Carolyn, um, do you have any recommendations on what to do if there is no contact person associated with that job opening? It, Generally, um, the really department uh, associated with that. So certainly um, ta um, talking to the HR department or someone from that department just to verify would be um, what I would do. If it's a really small company, they may not have a complete HR company, but even contacting um, uh, whoever they're, they often have several things. So sometimes they'll have a just kind of general web um, link that will link you back to someone uh, at their organization. Then you can um, uh, send a link there if they don't have a pers um, particular person or office and then they can send it to the right people. Typically, I try to kind of search that down too and see if I can call and find out who to send it to. And I would do that probably first, is uh, uh, 
find a, a number or a contact and then see if I can find out who's the hiring manager or who, who would be the appropriate person or the person in HR just to confirm. I think, okay, thank you. I think companies really appreciate it and it stands out when you've done that extra step to try to get it to the right person. Great. Uh, my next question is, how important is a cover page, or is it most? That's a great question, and the answer is it really depends. So some instructions will even tell you that they don't need a cover page or that they don't want a cover page. If um, you're doing an electronic submission that has asked you not to include one, don't include one. If they haven't said, Cover letters can be fabulous for you to show your personality, and resumes are very structured and kind of formatted, and they all kind of include the same types of information. Where a cover letter, you can go in and show your enthusiasm a little bit better uh, for the position and how you fit, and you can pull out certain things from your resume and go into further detail. Um, there, so I really like cover letters because I can see who you are better from them. So a lot of companies like them, and some do not. In fact, I have talked to many employers, and it's about—it seems like it's about 50/50. I've talked to employers that say that their cover letter is the strongest thing and the reason that they hire people versus their resume, and vice versa. So if they ask for both. I would, or um, give you an option to give both, I would give that because it's another kind of data point for them, especially since they don't know you, to get to know you. So it's a place where you can, again, with my example, with the camera or with the microscope, you can help, see the, help them see you more clearly in that. And so I think they're fabulous um, for that aspect. So, with a cover letter, um, it's the only place to name drop, too, on a resume. So if so-and-so referred you, or not on a resume, on an application. So if someone referred you to that position in that first paragraph on a cover letter is a place for you to say that. It's um, considered good standard practice uh, where you wouldn't necessarily include that in your resume format. So it also gives you an opportunity to address some issues that are more difficult to address in the resume. Okay, thank you. Our next question um, is, how do you tailor your resume if you do not have experience on a job description? For example, two years in a supervisory role. So let me see if I can get clarity on that question. So for a supervisory role that they haven't had supervision yeah, I think I think the exa the examples coming from um, a job posting, they're looking for two years in a supervisory role, and okay. how would how would you tailor your resume if you do not have experience for that job? So I would probably look at any of my transferable skills that I have that you would need to have for supervisory uh, roles. So perhaps I haven't had a formal work experience being a supervisor. But perhaps I have um, taken on a leadership role in a club or an organization or volunteer work or something else where it may not be formally documented, but I have used those skills and worked with people and collaborated and maybe delegated um, in other areas, and I would want to focus on that. And I might create a little bit of a functional resume section with that piece so that I can show all of those skills that I have even though I don't necessarily have them in a official work capacity. Okay. So you, you mentioned functional resumes. That's, that's our next question. How do, you act, how do you organize a functional resume? For example, uh -huh. how, do you, how do you indicate where and when you developed a particular skill? So functional resumes, what they do is they have a bigger kind of skill section or um, qualification section, depending how you want to break that out, 
typically skill sections in the direction that you want to go into. So you can take any experience that you have from um, classes, projects, volunteer work, um, clubs, organizations, anywhere that you have experience in the direction that you want to go in and put it under that skill section. You'd still be doing it with the bullet point kind of pieces, but you're showing them the direction you want to go. And then the other thing with a functional resume is you typically minimize um, some of maybe your work history that does not relate to that area. So, for instance, if I um, grew up working in a moving company and I packed uh, uh, people's homes and moved furniture and I'm applying for a position in science, that probably is, most of the things that I did there probably aren't going to directly relate. So I may minimize that at the bottom if I want to show that I have some work history just to show that piece. And I'll just have like the company names and the dates um, where they're located and the dates that I work there. And I'm not going to have a lot of bullets there because I'm going to have that earlier up in that skill section on where I really want to go. So I'm going to have my science experience or my lab experience up there. Things that are going to be more important and relevant to where I want to go. Another piece I can put on a functional resume um, too, uh, depending on the amount of experience I have in that area, would be relevant coursework. And under relevant coursework, I would only I would put those things that are really closely related to the position and or things that would make you really stand out. So if everybody takes organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, that unless that's specifically mentioned in the um, job description, I may not put that in, but if there's something special that I have with that, that's where I may want to highlight that piece. If I put everything I ever did under coursework, it waters it down, so I might miss the really unusual pieces or the additional pieces that you have that I really don't want you to miss. So does, uh, does that answer the question for you? I think it does. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, when you're formatting your resume, is there a specific font or font size that is preferred? That's a great question too. So there isn't necessarily a specific font. A lot of people want, use just a basic font, whether it's uh, New Roman Times or any font that's very clear and easy to read. You don't want anything you know, super elaborative or scrolly or things that's going to be hard to read. So lots of kind of basic fonts that you can read easily. Uh, font size, typically you want about a 10 to 11 point font for your resume. Um, and the things you can do if you like have a, a little bit more that you need to get on one page, you know, the margins you can move from 0.5 to 1 so you can kind of inch so you can make them a little longer or a little smaller sometimes to fit just another little piece on. But I keep the font the same. Um, I would, to make things stand out, I would italics or bold uh, fonts uh, and keeping it the same font versus um, using multiple fonts on a resume. Um, generally, you want to keep the same font but do things to make um, certain sections stand out. So I might bold an experience section and then my italics, the name of the position that I had to make those stand out. Uh, the other place on a resume where you want a font size larger than that is really with your name. You want them to be able to see it as you at a glance, so you're going to want to increase your font size there, uh, and that is the one place uh, where I would say definitely uh, make that bigger than anywhere else. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. Um, when you're looking at your resume, um, do you think links to your professional website or LinkedIn should be included in an electronic resume? If you have them, uh, they are a great thing to add. And I wouldn't add them unless they're really up to date too. So if they're going to show an old kind of professional uh, profile, 
uh, you may not want to do that, but if you have taken the time to update that and have it look the way you want it to look, absolutely they can be great. Okay. And it's also really, really good to include them if you have a common name too in the application so um, that employers tend to look people um, look people up. Not everyone does, but a lot do. So making sure they have the right Jane Smith, if that's your name, and if it's really common, is can be very, very helpful for them. Okay. Um, well, we are running low on time. So, um, Carolyn, uh, would you like to uh, provide us with some take-home messages? Sure. So to me, if you were to remember nothing else, these are the points to remember. Uh, creating a resume takes time to create a really solid resume. Focus most of your time on your bullet points, making them clear, concise, and quantifiable when you can to really capture the employer's attention. You want to have their attention caught within the top half of your first page um, because if you go to page two and have great stuff on page two, if you haven't captured them on page one, they're not going to, they may not even make it to page two. You want to make sure you've shown your relevance clearly on the first half of the first page. So make sure your relevant experience at least it starts there. Um, I think the last point I really want to make with this is just to remember that you are the solution to the employer's problem. So when you're crafting your resume, you really want to think, how can I show that I'm the solution to the employer's problem? How can I show added value, impact, and outcome? from my previous experience, because if you can show that well, they're going to be interested in you. And if you can show how they fit well, they're really going to be very interested in you. So, so part of B says, think from the employer's point of view and put that hat on when you're reviewing your resume. Make sure somebody else has reviewed your resume. Make sure there's no spelling errors on it. I had a person submit a resume and they were spelling the word as, but they left an extra S on it. Spell check did not catch it. So have a live human being or multiple live human beings um, check your resume too for those things that spell check might not catch or maybe you've just read it so many times that you automatically fill in what it's supposed to say versus what it actually did say. So I think that wraps it up. Okay. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take this time now to uh, thank you, the audience, for joining us today, and our guest panelist, Carolyn Kilduffer, for giving us insights on how to prepare an effective resume. I would also like to thank the members of the Student Council for Innovation who helped put, put the webinar on, uh, Lauren Fulmer, Zaid Ma, Ryan Frederick, Ryan Manser, and Betty Maddox for, for all their work in preparing for today's webinar. Uh, recordings of today's webinar and information about future events are made available at sustainablematerialschemistry.org. Um, I invite you to join us there. And if you enjoyed today's webinar, I would um, also um, point you to um, follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, thanks again for joining us today. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please direct your questions to the webinar organizers, and we will forward your questions and comments on. Thank you, and have a great afternoon.